Well, good morning, everyone. I don't know what it is, but uh, it's only by Sunday. The numbers get less. <laughs> but there is a good reason for it. Uh, people are on holiday, and we wouldn't take that away from them. Uh, it's good to have Amy back, leading us in our worship. And we're just going to have a, a time this morning. I started off this morning feeling if um, what I had to say would be finished within eight minutes. <clears throat> and then I went through it again this morning and things seemed to change. But the importance of confession. I suppose it took me back to the time when uh, Dora and I had just come to know Jesus as our saviour, our lives had been transformed, and we got involved um, with a Billy Graham crusade, and it was at, at a church in Andover, Wayhill Methodist Church, where we had meetings to prepare for the crusade. And with Billy Graham, he said, pray for people, pray for three people, take upon your heart three people and pray for them. Pray for them by name. Pray that the Holy Spirit would minister to them and bring them to that place when the crusades would be on and the relays would be in operation, that they would come to hear the message through Billy Graham. Now, many of you don't know some of his ministry, but I want you to know that every week Every week on one of the God programs, it's not the God channel, but one of the channels, every week there is what they call a, a Billy Graham meeting. Uh, when he was holding these massive crusades and also not just ministering to thousands, but it ended up being millions who listened to this man of God. And he just told it straight. But in all the preparation, uh, we were encouraged to learn some verses of scripture by memory. And uh, when you think of the life of George Verwer and the ministry of Operation Mobilization, he knew he was moving into countries where the word of God would not be allowed, where he couldn't uh, bring it openly in front of him and he would memorize scripture. I remember at the time he said, I have now completed memorizing the whole gospel of Matthew. And you say, well, is it possible to memorize like that? As long as you're willing to try, God is going to do the next bit. And so we had to learn certain scriptures that would help us. And I'm going to bring those scriptures to you this morning. I'm trusting that you will take this on board because although I have the lovely joy and Dorian has the joy and I'm sure Sam has and I'm sure Chris has and Ian will have done and I trust Paul will have done but every member of this fellowship needs to know how to lead somebody to Jesus. What scriptures to turn to. Uh, not just to tell your testimony but to say this is what God says in his word. And so we're going to go through this very briefly. And therefore, the importance of confession. One of the first verses we had to learn was Romans chapter 3, verse 23. And uh, this, this message this morning has been brought to me because of the fact that I went in this week to see David Adams, who is our... Uh, optician here in Lidney and uh, I wasn't very pleased with what with the outcome was after I had the, the uh, check on my eyes because there had been such a deterioration on this side that although I had new glasses in January I have to have a new new glasses uh, now uh, and uh, the shop came and it said that would be £245 you know said quickly it doesn't sound so much does it but he mentioned something, and he brought out this scripture, and there's two scriptures particularly, Romans 3.23 and Romans 6.23. And in his uncertainty, and then he started sh sharing, and so therefore, 
by completing it. But in Romans 3.23, it's, it's a good scripture to learn because it makes it very clear. The emphasis is on the first word of this particular scripture. All, yes. Now I've added that in. All, yes. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All of us. Everyone in the whole of the world has fallen short of the glory of God. And if we can grasp hold of that, and this word all, then we could pant up with think about Romans, uh, sorry, John chapter 3, verse 16. You know, that God so loved the world. So he's, in, he's involved in the whole of creation. He's involved in all of the nations. He's involved in the whole world. Why? Because all have sinned. And uh, following that scripture, we have uh, coupled with that, Romans 6, 23, it says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And it was that one that he was bringing out. And he said, I shared this scripture with a, a certain person, and they said, Ma, that's a bit, that's a bit hard, isn't it? You know, the wages of sin is death. I mean, how many people are living in sin? And it's to them, death. Yeah, but the good news is, the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And it was when, when you couple these two together, there's an answer. And the answer is not just the fact your sins are going to be forgiven and will be forgiven. The glory of it is that God is giving to us for our sin a gift. And that gift is eternal life. That gift is the opportunity to live with him and reign with him forever. When uh, we were in Bible college, and that's a long time ago now, it's back in the 60s, uh, but when we were in Bible college, uh, Brash Bonsall used to say to us, you know, we have words, we need to know what is the meaning of words, what's in the background of them. And he used to use two words, one was everlasting, and the other was eternal. And the everlasting doesn't have a beginning, but it does have an end. Whereas eternity has a be beginning and an end. And he would have us having playing around with words and biblical words, and it gave us a deeper understanding of what God was saying. Saying, so this gift, you know, when I receive a gift. I really just thank the person who's given it to me. We, well recently, I say recently, I had a gift and um, Doreen bought me something while I was away. And somehow it's got damaged. Now nobody knows who, how it got damaged. We can come to all sorts of reasons why it may have got damaged. But it has got damaged. And, um, I remember Doran saying, that wasn't cheap, you know. <laughs> I said, I know it wasn't that. But, but we got to bring eternity into the system, have not you? Into the whole way of life. Uh, it's, it's not what we possess, it's who we possess. That's what makes all the difference to life. And so that's why it's so important that if we as a church would grasp hold of these first two scriptures, Romans 3, chapter 20, uh, verse 23, and Romans 6, 23, put those together, link them into John 3, 16, and we've got a sermon that you can minister to people about the fact of where they stand at this present moment, what God is offering to them, and how they can receive it, because God loves them so much that he sent his son into the world to die on the cross of Calvary for them. And then I, you know, said, well, what's the point in all this? Well, where, what do we gain 
from confessing our sins. It's amazing how often we want to hang on to what we've got. Even though it's sinful, it's enjoyable. Uh, I'll look into that in, well, in more in, in a minute. But what do we gain from confessing our sins? Well, in that scripture, in Romans 6, 23, it says we gain eternal life. We gain a gift. We gain something which has already been paid for. Well, why should I pray a prayer to God and have somebody listening in? Because quite often when we talk to somebody about Jesus, we say, would you like to pray? Would you like to ask Jesus into your heart right now? Would you like to pray the sinner's prayer? Would you like to just come yourself to Jesus? And, and they say, yes. Or, I'm not quite sure yet. Or sometimes the person who's asking you would say, would it be helpful if I helped you pray? Because maybe you've never prayed like this before. But they end up praying and asking the Lord to forgive them their sins, asking the Lord to come into their hearts, into their lives. And we always used to say to the boys and girls who made that commitment, now what do you say? And they say, thank you, Jesus. Isn't it nice to say, have somebody say thank you for the gift that you've given to them? Well, why shouldn't we thank God for the gift that he's given to us, the gift of eternal life? So does it matter that somebody's listening in? No, because they are praying that prayer with you at that time that the Holy Spirit will come upon you and witness with your spirit that you be have become a child of God. So what happens when I do pray? Well, let's look at the scripture just before Romans 6, 23. Know that you've been set free from sin and have become slaves to God. The benefit you reap leads to holiness and the result is eternal life. A lot of people in our day and age, especially the humanists and the atheists, they believe that when you die, you're dead. That's it. Finished. There's no life after death. There's no heaven. And of course, there wouldn't be a hell. But they actually believe there's nothing beyond the grave. Well, praise God, there is something beyond the grave. And it's an exciting place to go to. There are, running, going around at present uh, in the fellowship, there's a couple of books, and it's about a minister who died uh, for eight hours. And then somehow he came round. And as he came round, he heard the porters saying to each other, well, we better take him down to the morgue now. And suddenly he said, but I'm not dead. I'm not dead, I'm alive. One of them fainted, and the other one wet themselves. <laughs> with shock. But he wrote this book, and what he saw in heaven. And I love the honesty about him, he said, don't ask me to explain, just read what I've seen and I'm sure when you get there it will be even better than that. And so I don't know where the book is, I got one in the glove compartment in my car at the moment. We didn't want it to out. I've tried to order some more, I see now that they're back on the market and uh, we'll try and get some more. I've got some books here that I bought and I'll talk about those in a moment. So the benefit that you and I can have is not only forgiveness of sin, but also the fact that we, the result of all that, our life will be led in holiness before the Lord and before people, and we have eternal life. 
So from, from confession to conception. You know what's taken place, I know what's taken place, but there are many, many people who have no idea whatsoever. But this is another good verse to learn. I mean, when we confess sin, what happens to it? Where does it go to? If, it says here, we confess our sins, and I left, there's lots of scriptures, lots of verses, where I've underlined, underlined just one little tiny word, and that is the word if. And if has a lot to say to us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So your life is going to be changed. You're going to be different. It's going to be a different life, a different lifestyle. You, you'll be seen to be different. And uh, there are many, many um, testimonies, especially within marriages, where either the wife got saved first, or whether it's the wife or the husband, they've said, what's happened to you? And that's why it was that I drove, drove all the way in my little Ford 8 Anglia that I had, 1938 Ford 8 Anglia, going all the way from the other side of Blackpool, driving all the way down into Hampshire to Andover to find out what had ever taken place with my wife when she said, I know you think I'm crazy, and I honestly thought she was. But I've just met God in my living room. I'm pretty sure we have somebody who comes here on a Wednesday night and they're still trying to work out God in reality and in relationship to you and to me. This great creator, we sang that song, the great creator became my saviour and all God's fullness dwelleth in me. Wonderful, wonderful, thrilling song. So he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So we're going to be clean. That's why we're going to be different. And when I came to know Christ as my Saviour, I'll tell it and I'll tell it again and again and again because if you could have been in that crew room on a Monday morning to hear conversations of those servicemen about all that they'd been up to that weekend and they were thrilled about how many pints they drank and who they'd been with, this, that and the rest of it and I said, well I've had a great weekend too and you know it's amazing, they, they're all there goggle eyed saying, yeah tell us all about it and I said I give my heart to Jesus, I've been converted we're never so quiet. And somehow it stuns people to believe that somebody who can have such a life and a vocabulary in the forces can suddenly be changed. It says that when anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. He is not the same anymore, a new life has begun. In 2 Corinthians 5, 17, there we are. Therefore, if anyone is in, in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. The old has gone. Have you got that? The old has gone. If you have not been absolutely transformed by the power of the living Christ, you've never been converted. Even though you might have said a prayer, and you might say, he hasn't answered it. How have you come? In humility? Have you come realizing that as you are, how can a sinful God accept me? I think we read, I haven't got all these scriptures written down, it's just what comes to my mind as I'm ministering. But we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, I believe, in verse 14. 
It says the man without the spirit does not accept the things that come from the spirit of God. For they are foolishness to him. And he cannot understand them. Why? Because they are spiritually discerned. The, the authorised version says, the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. And those who are natural, who are normal to many, many people, without hope, without Christ, without understanding, without the knowledge of knowing that their lives can be changed, the natural man feels that the things that was preaching and what the Word of God is saying is foolishness. But the Bible says, but unto us who are saved. It's a new life. And when something takes place which is real, we will see it. We will recognise it. We will know it. When Dora and I were out in Liberia in West Africa, and we taught, in that period of time we were there, we, in the event, I, we did something I said that we would never do. God had called us to do a youth work. God had called us to, to evangelise the young people of Liberia. And you're not going to take see me taking up all my time teaching in schools. Well, you know, it's amazing how God has another way, doesn't he? First of all, he has to show you where all the young people are. They're in the schools. They're in the classroom. They're a ready congregation, if you like. They're an audience. What for? Because we were asked to go in and share the word of God with the school children. From the youngest to the men who were sitting in the back row. Fully grown men who might be in grade four or three, but that they were there to learn. I got a book here, you might not believe it, it goes back to 1966. Covers have gone. First lesson, who made God? That's the first thing he ministered on. Secondly, who is God? Next lesson, why did God make man? That's a good one. Another one, how did sin enter the world? And then having it entered it in, what is sin? And then knowing your enemy. <coughs> Who is he? And then where is heaven? And how can you be saved and be sure of it? Who is this Jesus? What does the Bible teach about children? All sorts of ministries here, dating back to 1916 something, that God gave us when we were out in Liberia to minister in not one school, 12 different schools where we could preach the word of God. See people come into Christ. And these young people who had been dedicated to the works of Satan under the power of a country devil or the witch doctor to be under his dominion and as Doran used to say you could see the darkness in their eyes but when they open their hearts and they confess their sin and they ask Jesus to come in you could look out when you went round the different classes you knew the eye is the window of the soul. There's something about it when their eyes were alight and alive because of what Christ had done. So what has taken place? We ended up by saying the old is gone, 
The new has come. You know these scriptures well. Good, then you can quote them when you're leading somebody to Jesus. How can I be saved? What do you mean, being born again? John 3, 3 to 5, Jesus declared to begin with, he said to Nicodemus, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. And Nicodemus, quite old, you know, he was a very, not only a religious man, he was a very well educated man, as he listened to what Jesus had to say, that no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the Spirit. And then, of course, he also says, flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying to you, Nicodemus, you must be born again. It grieves me the number of years that I had been going to church and going to a cathedral school and having morning assemblies every six days of the week that no one at any one time told me I needed to be born again. I was taught tradition, I was taught some good things, but I was never taught the most vital thing that brings you into a relationship with God. You must be born again. Not you ought to be, or you should be, or you could be, you must be. And I would long to have the opportunity, not just within Lydney, but to go across the forest of Dean or throughout Gloucestershire to go from church to church and have the opportunity just to stand at the front and say, have you been <laughs> born again? Just like Dorian said to that young girl who was a Sunday school teacher in Stanley Park in Blackpool, have you been born? Not only that, Dorian said, when were you born again? And she said, we don't teach that in our church. It's as if we're fanatical. No, this is the truth. This is Jesus speaking to a very religious, educated man. He wanted to know how the old could be gone and the new could come. And Jesus said, you must be born again. No, I don't know. It may be people here this morning never come into that experience. You enjoy the fellowship, you enjoy the songs, you enjoy the worship, you're quite open when people pray, you're listening to the word, but have you been born again? That's the important thing. And from when you are birth, hallelujah, you are babies. We are three under three. And we praise God for them. But they don't stay babies forever, do they? When I hear of things that are taking place in our nation, in homes, in this country, when we read or we see the news on television of babies that have been battered to death, does that bother us? And when asked, the husband said, I couldn't cope with the screaming. And it costs a darling child his or her life. So from birth, as babies, we ventured into that next step where we received Christ as our Saviour, it says, as many as received him, he gave them the power to become the sons of God, even to those who believe on his name, and how they were born and how they were not born. We've all been born of water. But we're not born into the family of God because our parents were Christians. 
there has to be an individual experience. And when you've asked Christ into your heart, where do you go from there? Well, the Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2, like newborn babies, I love the word in the modern translation, crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation, now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. Have you tasted that? Have you tasted this change in your lifestyle, the change in your heart, the change in your mind, the change in what comes out of your mouth. Why? How can that be so? You've tasted the very presence of God. You've taste, tasted the moving of the Spirit upon your soul. You've tasted that the Lord is good. And we're encouraged further in the letter to Peter, it says, grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. How can you grow in grace? Well, I know this is a big book. I know there's a lot in it. There's 39 chapters in the Old Testament. There's 27 chapters in the New and for all you mathematicians, you know very well that makes 66 chapters in the book. And the book in the Bible as a, a shortened version of the whole Bible you'll find in 66 chapters in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah was a great prophet. The other week I read to you from the last portion of Isaiah chapter 52 and part of Isaiah chapter 53. And historically we know that Jesus had to be born at the right time of history when the Romans would have their empire for they were the only people who brought in that horrific death by crucifixion. Wasn't there before the Roman Empire? And yet in Isaiah 53, it speaks about he had to be crucified for our sins. Therefore, in history, historically, whether it's 700 years before or 750 years before, but all those years before, the beginning of the New Testament, God had to set up an empire that would bring into being a horrific death which was spoken of all those years before that his own son would have to go through. But then we're encouraged to grow in love and in faith. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 3, now when we talk about Thessalonians we have 14 letters, we've got Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, and then you get 14 letters written about Peter's life, Paul's life, uh, the Acts of the Apostles and the Gospel of Luke are written by Dr. Luke, and you start learning these things and seeing their different ministries, the different places that they've gone to, and Dorian and I, well I was preparing last night, and Dorian was watching a program, and it was about the island of Kos. And Kos. There was evidence there of the early Christian walk and ministry. And it appears on the island, there are placards up in different places where Paul preached. Yeah, where Paul preached. And he... Luke was with him and helping to write the history. So it was a very interesting program. So we ought always to thank God, not for, for you, brothers, sisters, and rightly so. Why? Because your faith is growing more and more, and the love every one of you has for each other is increasing. That's another evidence. It's living together. It's worshipping together. It's having communion together. 
It's listening to the word of God together. It's sharing the word of God together. So there's 14 letters from Paul. And there's also the Gospels. And then you get letters to John, to Peter, and that famous book, the book of Revelation, the last book in the Bible, yet to be fulfilled. But it will be, and we're getting closer to it year by year. That Christ, who came and lived and died and arose again from the dead, and there's clear evidence this has been checked again and again and again, Christ died. Not what the Gospel of Barnabas says. Do you know the Gospel of Barnabas, or the Gospel according to Barnabas, is the most printed Gospel handed out to Muslims in Pakistan. Why? Because Jesus never died, he only fainted. And it goes on through about this Jesus, and he ended up living a normal life out in India. It is absolute sacrilege, and that's why it's not in the canon of Scripture. And the Muslims lap it up, because they got proof that Jesus never died on the cross. He only swooned, he only fainted. But if he had never died, he could never have risen again. If he had never died and risen, he had never ascended back to his father. If he had never died and risen and ascended, he couldn't fulfill that promise that he has already made, and I shall come again. And he's going to come again. Jesus Christ is going to return. He will return with his church. And it says that the dead in Christ shall be raised up to meet our loved ones in the air. She said, the book, uh, epistle to the Thessalonians. You read about these things. They say, well, I didn't know that. Well, you won't know it unless you read it. We can have a good book, do you know, the best book that's ever been written. They don't say anymore how many Bibles are sold. I wish they could say how many Bibles are read. Because often they're purchased and they're never read. This is the living word. The written word, it leads you to the living word. And I brought with me today, I've only got six copies left. This book is called In His Steps. It was written by Charles Sheldon. It goes back, I think, into the 1800s. It doesn't read like that. But he had a vision, a passion, to write something which was upon his heart because he was not seeing the evidence of the life of Christ being lived out in the churches and in his church. So he wrote this book. I'm not ashamed to say I'm 83 years old. I can cry when I read this. I can be moved full of joy and excitement when I read this. And in, he brought to his church a challenge. And he said, if you're willing to take upon your heart the following, what would Jesus do? In everything you do, everything you say, everywhere you go, whatever, what would Jesus do? If you're willing To see that come into fruition in your own life, will you come into the side room? And will you, we can pray together, seek God's face together, and that's how it all began. And the cost, the cost of individuals with good jobs, good professions, good prospects, had to change their whole lifestyle in what they did, how they did it, where they did it. Why? Because they said, what would Jesus do? Now, I've only got six copies. I, wrote, I bought every one that was on Amazon, but they said they're getting some more in. I want everyone, when you take one, 
Read it, pass it on. Let somebody else know where it's been passed on to, so we can move them about. But I'll tell you, you'll go without your tea, you'll get your head stuck in there, I couldn't put it down. And it's years since I, I read it. I found this tatty old book in my library of books. Pages going all brown, print so small. No joints just really. It'll change your life. Because it's all about Jesus. It's all about what he's expecting of us. It's all about the fact that he's given us the power to overcome. He's given us the love to reach out to the lost. He's given us a new lifestyle which is having an impact upon the community. And he's taken our, our eyes off ourselves, off our selfishness, everything about me, 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 and it's redirecting us to him and beyond. And I'll tell you, that'll really touch you. And that's why I want you to read it. Colossians chapter 3. No, chapter 1, sorry. And inshallah, in there, it's in verses 3 to 6. I've, got, I've picked out... Uh, just a phrase, and I'm going to read verses uh, 3 onwards. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all the saints, the faith and love that spring from the hope that is stored up for you in heaven and that you have already heard about in the word of truth, the gospel that has come to you all over the world, this gospel is bearing fruit and growing, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and understood God's grace in all its truth. All over the world, the go this gospel is bearing fruit and growing. And so it should be here in Lydney. It should be through your lives, touching other lives, that you should be bearing fruit and growing. And in the same chapter, a little bit further on, we've got the same sort of thing, only it's extended a little bit more. It's bearing fruit and growing in knowledge. And this is where you get your knowledge from. This is the living word of God speaking to us. So verse 10. And we pray this in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and may please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God. Wonderful. Being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might so that you may have great endurance and patience and joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. See what he's done. I haven't put the text down, but this is what he says has happened. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. So, we've gone through what it means to confess our sins. We've gone through the reason why we need to, that we might be born again of the Spirit of God. So that he now is living within us and our lives are being transformed. And when anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have gone. New ones have come into being. And we've moved on to the fact that we're growing in love 
and faith, or faith and love, and then we're bearing fruit and we're growing, and then in that growth we are also growing in love. There's so much I could share. Communion is communication. In Luke chapter 22, we often read from here when we take communion here, and there it says, when the hour came, and his apostles reclined at the table, and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Jesus wanted to share with his disciples what was going to be the outcome of his life and of his death. And so the Last Supper is very, very moving. The Passover, and he has his disciples with him. And I'm just going to read a little bit more. It says here, For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. And I was taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you, for I tell you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. That's why we break communion. That's why even Jesus, he brought them together. It was communion and communication. He was sharing with them his life and he was sharing with them his death. So I just read those. In Acts chapter 2, verse 42, we read, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayer. That's why we come to church. That's why we have fellowship with, it, with each other. That's why it's good. It says, forsake not the assembly of yourselves together as the manner of some are or is. It's in Psalm Hebrews, Hebrews, isn't it? Anyway, in other words, don't stop coming to church. Don't stop coming in the Halloween fellowship. Don't stop coming and breaking bread together with the fellowship. Don't stop learning more and more and more about Jesus and the life that he wants you and I to have. Consecration. If it isn't ours, it's seas. It's one of those things, isn't it? So here we have consecration. In 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, it says, Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God. You are not your own. You were bought at a price, at a price. His death, you were bought at a price. Therefore, honour God with your body. Well, there, was a, there are scriptures that, you know, when you start reading in the epistles and some of the things, what I like about the Bible it tells you as it is. It's straight. I, I was reading something just yesterday about a particular sin that people suffer with. And I thought, how can I say that? It may be affect somebody here in the congregation. It was so blatant. But you see, God calls a spade a spade, as it were. He tells the truth. He speaks the truth. He is the truth. So your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, in you, whom you will receive from God. In Galatians chapter 2 verse 20 we read, I, Paul said, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. All the ministry that Paul had, all the places that Paul went, all the beatings that he'd suffered, all the imprisonments 
that you've been cast into. And yet in it all, he said, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. There was such an assurance within Paul's life that whatever happened to him, he would accept it as the will of the Lord. Consecration is what is required. I am not my own. He's told me that. But I'm his. If I am his temple, his Holy Spirit dwells in me. If I am his temple, his love should dwell in me. If I am his temple, his hope is in me. If I am his temple, yes, his healing is in me. But he's given to us all these things. And how much of us come to the end there? Yeah. So, confession. We make a statement confession is good for your soul. No, confession is good more for your soul, more than for your soul. He takes away your heart, a heart of stone, a heart that denies the Christ, a heart that blasphemes uh, about Christ, uses his name in blasphemy. He, he takes that heart away, that heart has been governed by our own selfishness of I want, I want, I want, you know, or I need. And he takes that away and he gives you a heart of flesh. One that feels for others. One that has a love that reaches out, touching other lives. And then he started taking away man's spirit. That which controlled you up into this moment of time when you were born again, when you received him as your saviour. And he says, it says in the scriptures, and I've given them my spirit. Can you imagine that? The spirit in Christ has been given to you and to me. What a thrill. And then we talk about the Holy Spirit who indwells us, who empowers us, who overshadows us, who directs us. What a wonderful spirit he is. May he be the one that directs every purpose of your life. That you might come to that place where you walk in his steps and say in every circumstance, what would Jesus do? Father, thank you for our time together. There's so much that can be said, but Lord, thank you. Thank you that when we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Thank you, Lord, that when you come into our hearts and minds, you give us your spirit. Give us a new heart, a new spirit. We're different. Anyone who's in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are gone. Everything becomes new. Lord, you've given us an opportunity to grow in faith, to grow in love, to grow in knowledge. And we pray, Lord, we'll take all these things on board. And ask, Lord, that you'll take us. That's the hymn says, Lord, take me as I am, Lord, make me all thine own for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen.